Hello and welcome to today's remote session, BEC, the FBI, and the 2021 IC3 report, demystifying the world's largest cybercrime. I want to say thank you to our friends over at Abnormal Security and the Federal Bureau of Investigation for sharing two of their agents with us today. So thank you. Got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to get right into things here. Uh, so business email compromise is not really a new thing. Uh, you know, it used to be called CEO fraud attacks, and I think it probably just kind of confused people, uh, thinking that CEOs were ripping people off or something. So it kind of evolved into something really what it is. It's a business email compromise. So with the release of the new FBI IC IC3 report, business email compromise takes the top spot for financial damage for the seventh year in a row. This is kind of a stat that's kind of staggering to me because I was always thinking that ransomware was the big one, right? But this is accounting for nearly $2.4 billion in losses. That's B billions. That's a lot of money. The good news is that more people are aware of the problem than ever before. But the bad news is it doesn't seem to be changing anything. It's time that we do change that narrative. And I'm hoping that today with our conversation with these three gentlemen, uh, that we can get more awareness around this topic, get people thinking about it a little differently, and perhaps even get uh, some of our, our staff and our colleagues to start paying a little bit more, uh, more attention to some of this stuff as it's coming in and, and maybe setting up some different uh, fail safes. So that being said, I want to get into who do we have here today? We've got Scott Hellman, Supervisory Special Agent with the FBI, Pete Travin, he's also a supervisor, supervisory special agent with the FBI, and Crane Hasselt, he's the director of threat intelligence at Abnormal Security. Welcome, gentlemen. Before I let them go, I've got a quick housekeeping thing for those of you that aren't with us normally. Um, today's slides, a couple URLs that is. ISC3 report is available for you to download as well. I just said that wrong, uh, but the FBI report is available to download in the resource tab. Uh, if you have questions, uh, throw them out there. Uh, we're going to take questions toward the end. Uh, you'll get a certificate of attendance that's downloadable after about 50 minutes today, so uh, watch for that. If you have any audio or video issues, hit F5. That will refresh uh, your screen. should fix most of the problems out there. Um, generally, these are on demand. Today, this one's a live only, so we, we don't really have the ability to replay this one. So unfortunately, um, it will be uh, just a, today, it's live, and so try to get your questions in there. So that being said, I'm going to turn things over to our group. Gentlemen, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Tom, uh, and thanks, Reverend, for, uh, for, for sticking with us today. Um, really looking forward to this discussion uh, with Scott and Pete to better understand not just what was in the IC3 report, the Internet Crimes uh, Complaint Center report, um, but also to sort of get, get some good insights from the law enforcement perspective about you know, how we can better tackle the various cyber crimes that are continually becoming more and more impactful to everyone around the world um, every single year. Um, so before we uh, before we begin, you know, I, I wanted to start with just, you know, just talking about, you know, what is IC3? What is the Internet Crime Complaint Center. Um, Pete, can you give us sort of a general overview of what IC3 is and what it does? Yeah, sure thing, Crane. And uh, thank you, Tom, for giving us the opportunity to speak today. Um, whenever, um, you know, us and the FBI can have a chance to talk with the public, I think it's always it always makes our job a little easier. And hopefully for all of you that are dealing with these kind of events and situations day to day, uh, it makes it kind of a a better situation if and when you guys uh, become targeted by these these kind of fraudsters and these these situations that we're going to be talking about today. So the the mouthful, the Internet Crime Complaint Center, also known as IC3, IC3 has been around since the uh, the year 2000. Um, originally, it was set up to be kind of a central clearinghouse to have complaints be provided regarding internet fraud complaints or cyber crime matters. Initially, this is surrounding um, online fraud. It also dealt with some intellectual property right matters, as well as computer intrusions. It has since advanced over its 20 years plus years in existence to economic espionage, such as trade secret violations, online extortion, international money laundering and identity theft, romance fraud, and then obviously the topic that we're going to be talking quite a bit about today, uh, business email compromise. Um, this the, the center is uh, located in um, West Virginia, and it's uh, staffed by um, FBI personnel from the FBI Cyber Division, as well as their Criminal Investigative Division. Um, it's, a, it's a smaller group that deals with all the complaints that come in. And as you can see from 
this year's uh, the, the 2021 IC3 report, it gets really a robust set of data that comes in. One thing we do like to highlight though is uh, the data is only good as what comes in. So um, typically we're only getting probably about 40 to 45% of the actual uh, complaints that are actually experienced are reported to the IC3. So um, keep in mind that the data set is based on reported to the IC3. There's obviously other fraud numbers out there that we all have seen, um, but that's why there might be a, a disparate number if you're looking at larger um, views regarding the BEC problem, as well as with you know, ransomware, which we'll, we'll touch upon you know, later in the, in the discussion. Crane, back to you. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. I appreciate that that insight. I think, you know, IC3 as a whole, you know, what's great from my perspective as someone who looks at this, uh, you know, the the IC3 report when it comes out every year is really is somewhat like a like a little holiday for us in the BEC research uh, in the BEC research world, because it sort of it gives us a way to sort of, you know, while it's not all all inclusive, um, it is really just um, it gives us an idea of sort of comparing apples apples to apples when it comes to the variety of different types of attacks that we see um, in the cyber threat landscape. So you know, so what did the uh, what did the uh, the IC three report show this year? You know, at, at a you know at a very high level, you know, we've hit almost seven billion dollars worth of financial losses caused uh, by cybercrime in in twenty twenty one. Um, we're up to almost 850,000 total complaints that have been received by IC3. And overall, it was more than a 65% increase in total loss losses over the past two years. And so when you look at this, you know, when we look at really the past five years, we're talking about almost $20 billion that has been, that has been lost from, uh, from cybercrime attacks uh, here in the U.S. You know, IC3, as, as Pete was just mentioning you know, handles a ton of complaints every single day, you know, almost 3 million complaints over the past three years or over the past five years. And so it's just really a good indication that shows you how bad the cybercrime problem has gotten in recent years. And it's really a problem that's not going away anytime soon. And so before we move on to the first question I have for, for Pete and Scott, you know, just want to have a quick poll question. You know, to, to better understand the problems that I think most of the folks on this uh, on this call that are listening to this webinar um, are, are, are looking at, which type of cybercrime is most concerning to you, either professionally or personally? Is it business email compromise, ransomware, things like investment fraud, which was I think is an interesting finding from this year that we'll talk about here in a bit, or things like romance scams? Um, you know, which of these uh, really, you know, tops your concern scale when it comes to uh, when it comes to cybercrime, which ones are, you know, what, what type of cybercrime are, you know, you're stunned yourself, but maybe your family members, your colleagues at work, what are they thinking about every, every single day? Um, you know, business email compromise and ransomware have obviously been two of those main threats that have been, uh, that have been around for quite some time. And there's this battle back and forth about which one of those is sort of the more concerning to most employees. But obviously, as we'll see, ransomware and investment fraud um, have become, uh, have become uh, big concerns as well. So with that, let's move on, and I'll get to the first question here for um, uh, for 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 Pete and Scott. Um, Scott, we'll start with you, and then we'll follow Pete. I'll follow up after with you. You know, attacks overall have really increased, as we just saw from the the graphics from the recent report, um, and financial losses are up. You know, and as a general takeaway. What had, what's your perspective on what came out in the most recent report? Scott, we'll start with you. Thanks, Crane. Looking at the report, there were several themes that jumped out at me. And while there, there's many, these four I kind of wanted to, to highlight. One is on the BEC side, I think that there is a large gap in one specific mitigation tactic that could be used that I think we'll probably get get into throughout the course of this uh, this talk. Um, so a BEC mitigation gap. Two is that folks that are 60 and above are disproportionately feeling the effects of, of many of these types of crimes. Three is that I think overall, all of us are rushing a tremendous amount, whether it's at work, whether it's at home. And I think that rushing is heavily contributing towards uh, falling victim to some, several of these attacks. 
And lastly, I think with the drastic adoption of cloud services over the last probably 10 years, we're seeing a much larger footprint of various different network resources that are now you know, heavily exposed to cyber criminals when they all they have to do now is compromise you know username password and then possibly a multi-factor authentication token whereas in years past 10 15 years ago you'd have to have a lot more technical know-how in order to compromise a full-on network and so those are kind of the things that jumped out at me awesome thanks pete what about you what were your sort of your your main takeaways from a high level of the uh, of the report you know, kind of the, the thing that really uh, stood out to me was the fact that you know, the numbers aren't going down, right? I mean, so they're, they continue to increase. Um, you know, one would say that's probably good that we have more reporting, but it's obviously bad because we have people being victimized by different fraudsters in various schemes. Um, as, as Scott mentioned, you know, if you talk about the, you know, the sense of urgency that we're kind of all kind of wrapped up into, many of us are doing our banking and many things via mobile devices. Um, so we're kind of, I think we're even checked out even more. And that makes the carelessness probably um, a factor go up and then makes the risk factors also go up for individuals. And the fact that the, the numbers had gone up again, I think, you know, would definitely have to be related to, you know, uh, the, the pandemic. I mean, more people were remote than they had been before. More people were working from home um, on a regular basis. And I think that just added to a, a perfect storm of risk and concern that people are experiencing day to day, you know, in their with their their work emails, personal emails, and things of that nature. With, you know, and, and I think we're going to definitely touch on it, um, you know, in the future here, that the emails are kind of that that single point of that single point of failure, and at the end of all of those emails are us, the user. So. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. I think you know the 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 big increase that we saw from from 2020, uh, 2020 to twenty twenty one, I think, was pretty stark when you look at the overall increase at 65% increase. And, you know, when we did see a lot of the sort of when COVID first hit and everyone started working from home, obviously everyone's you know, first instinct and first concern was that you now have a lot of these employees specifically for organizations that are now relying on their, uh, so maybe, they, maybe their home defenses instead of a corporate defense on being on a corporate network and things like that. And so, yeah, so I, th I think it is interesting to sort of see how things morphed uh, really from between years zero and one with the first year of COVID and one to two with the second year of COVID and things obviously didn't, didn't get better that second year. So, you know, to move on, let's talk about business email compromise, BEC, which is, you know, obviously was something that my team at Abnormal that we look at every single day, you know, we are, uh, we're researching these attacks. We're looking at the attackers. We're engaging with these attackers to understand the full cycle of BEC attacks. And as Tom mentioned at the very beginning of this, we're now at for the seventh year in a row, BEC is the number one uh, number one cause of financial loss for across the cyber cyber crime threat landscape. Uh, and you know, when we look at the overall numbers, it's just kind of crazy how much it continues to grow. We're now at almost two and a half billion dollars uh, in overall loss uh, that we so that was reported last year, and obviously, Pete, as you said, that you know this is this is you know just what's being reported. Obviously, there's a big gap in what's reported and what's uh, what's actually happening out there. So that obviously, that two point four billion dollars is not the uh, the you know the, the actual total number. It's just what you know we can see, and you know we're talking about. You know, almost 20,000 attacks that were reported to IC3 last year. The average cost of, it, of, of each attack has gone up to about $120,000, um, which is we're now in six figures. In 2020, that number was about ninety dollars to $95,000. And the reason for that is, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll talk about financial supply chain compromise attacks here uh, in just a second. Um, but, you know, the sort of the, the overall shift of who is being, uh, who is being targeted by uh, who's being targeted by these attacks and who's being impersonated by these attacks um, has, has really changed. So, so let's, you know, when we talk about BEC, um, Pete, I'll start with you on this one. How do you see BEC attacks impacting organizations and how have you sort of seen that evolve uh, in recent years? 
You know, I think um, what what I've seen um, evolve kind of in the in this space is kind of what the you know the the, the bad actors or the, the criminals have been doing as far as the targeting. So you obviously realize that um, a lot of different companies that are targeted would have maybe large accounting departments, wire transfers based on the type of business they're in. Um, but what, what we've been seeing is you you see a shift in um, specifically uh, targeting the real estate industry. So like just like you had said earlier, if we're all working from home a little more and we're relying on our, our home office, home network defense, and we're a real estate agent, and we're doing things on, you know, with that sense of urgency and with time sensitive nature to, to close on a house, to get wire transfers that are usually larger in amount. So we're seeing a shift as it were against the different industries that are targeted. And that's not to say that, you know, the real estate industry is the only industry that's going to be targeted. They're still gonna go after construction companies, school districts, uh, many of the, um, a lot of the targeting that these individuals are doing are, are going for based on you know public offerings for construction projects that are occurring in certain counties or states. And they can see the construction companies that are working and bidding on the recent airport project job. And then they can use their efforts to target the individuals in that organization. Uh, you know, the, the criminal always has one thing on their side, time. What we don't have on the receiving end is if we're in uh, supposed to be sending out wires for large uh, material shipments or whatever it might be based on the industry, then we're relying again back on that on that accounting department or the controls that are in place in that organization. And then ultimately it's gonna that's gonna re be received into someone's inbox. And then that's when the where the pressure really might start. And so we, we again we kind of keep going back to that endpoint user. Um, but with that being said, you, you have to feel for that endpoint user because it's a lot of pressure that we're putting on all of our all of our employees and all of all of us to kind of be this you know always on the watch for that suspicious email is this really from the ceo is this from the head of accounting kind of thing and again the the bad guys are playing on that and hoping that we're coming into these situations wanting to do well and not wanting to fail and then they, they prey on that definitely when they when they, they target whatever industry it might be yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the things that we've seen is, you know, BEC, like most other cybercrime, is what we consider to be industry agnostic. I think it's really interesting that there are certainly some sectors that have a very sort of a, a sort of a nuanced and different approach that the attackers take, whether it's someone like the legal services in industry or real estate, where you did sort of the flavors that you see in BEC are a little bit different. But, you know, based on what, you know, what what we've seen is you know everyone uh, every company around the world could be the potential target of one of these BEC attacks they're you know at the end of the day the attackers the actors are just looking for people that can send them money and if an organization has money then they are the uh, they are the target potential target of a BEC attack uh, Scott move it over to you so uh, from from your perspective what have you know how have you seen BEC attacks um, evolve and impact organizations in recent years Actually, Crane, if it's okay, I actually wanted to jump on a, a comment that you made and a comment that, that Pete made as well, if that's okay, obviously in relation to this particular question. Yeah, um, absolutely. So you're talking about putting the onus on sort of the end user to be looking at emails and reviewing emails. And while, sure, there, um, I think it brings about a very strong point of we want to try and reduce the number of fraudulent emails that, that come down to the end user. And there are various ways that we can do that. There are technical um, solutions out there to try and reduce the number of fraudulent emails that get to the end user. But I guess I'll make this point. If we're looking at what is more difficult to do is prevent a BEC on the front end or try and recover lost funds on the back end. And I would heavily argue that from the FBI's perspective, trying to recover funds or investigate a crime on the back end and recover funds that way is going to be much more difficult than it is to prevent it on the front end for a couple of reasons. One, on the prevention side, let's say an organization has a thousand people. All 1,000 of those people have some semblance of responsibility, and you're essentially crowdsourcing the responsibility and distributing it across the entire enterprise. Whereas, let's say my office here, we've got 10 investigators that can potentially try and figure out who committed a crime and maybe if we can find that that stolen money, be able to recover it. 
a, a much more daunting task and we have far fewer resources compared to the resources of, of an enterprise. So that's one piece. And the second piece is when we're talking about how does BEC affect the organization, I think one piece that's missing here is, sure, I think it's obvious, when a, a company loses money, depending upon the size of the company and how much money gets lost, they're either going to be able to absorb it or they won't, or it has some impact. But Pete brought up a very good point. We're talking about real estate industry is getting hammered and who is really suffering the loss there. The real estate company, the title company isn't suffering the loss, it's the home buyer. The individual person is getting destroyed. Let's say here, I'm living out here in Silicon Valley, extremely expensive place to live. Homes in, in my neighborhood are all going for 1.8 million or 2 million and above. And so anybody who somehow has spent probably their entire life saving up enough to put a down payment on a house that costs $2 million, and then if the title company is sort of the victim, quote unquote, their email is getting compromised. Sure, their, their, their email is, is the one that's, or I guess their company is the victim, but it's my money as the home buyer that gets diverted and is gone. The title company will find somebody else to buy that house, but my money's gone and almost in many situations unrecoverable. So it's gonna affect me as the, as the individual and then wherever I go to work, that company is also going to be feeling it too because I'm now an employee that is unbelievably stressed out over losing, you know, potentially my life savings. So those those couple of pieces I thought were were important to bring up. Yeah, so I completely I completely agree with you there. And it's a nice little segue into sort of the next question that I had, which is around what you know what we're calling financial supply chain compromise, which is sort of this overall umbrella term that uh, that we are using that sort of encompasses a number of different types of emerging uh, flavors of BEC attack we've seen recently. So it might, might include things like vendor email compromise attack where you have uh, where you have a, a smaller vendor or supplier whose email is compromised and an attacker may sit on that mailbox for sometimes days, weeks, if not sometimes months, collecting intelligence to better understand you know, the, the payment processes, the customers that vendor has, you know, stealing copies of invoices, and then they insert themselves into an actual transaction. Or it could be something as, you know, something like a, a vendor impersonation or third-party impersonation spoofing attack, where instead of having that intelligence, they're going directly in and just impersonating a potential third party asking for an outstanding payment. Or it could be something like an aging report attack, where you have an attacker who is impersonating a CEO or some other executive asking for a, a copy of an aging report that contains all of the outstanding payment information and uh, and customer contact information that's required essentially to to send what is essentially a vendor email compromise attack without an actual compromise taking place. Or you could have something, Scott, like you were just talking about, that is a sort of you know getting in the middle of a real estate transaction where you have individual mailboxes uh, or some some somewhere along the way some third party has been has been compromised and the exact same sort of uh, sort of interception of a transaction occurs there sort of financial supply chain compromise is one of the sort of the more concerning trends that we've seen from our perspective in the BEC threat landscape and I'm interested to see you know how how have you guys seen sort of financial supply chain compromise or third party compromise really play into and, and factor into the BEC calculus in recent years. Um, Pete, I'll start, I'll start with you. Sure. I'm actually going to defer to Scott on this one um, because I think he probably has a little more yeah. topical um, uh, information to relate to it. Um, so Scott. Sure. Sure. No problem. Um, I think, when I when I'm listening to Ukraine, what I'm thinking of is, I think quite clearly, this, uh, you know, looking at vendor compromise or financial supply chain compromise, supply chain. Sorry, it clearly shows that the footprint of of where our criminals can attack or has just continues to expand, right? It's no longer attack the email of one company and that company is going to suffer the loss. It's going to be. There's so many different companies that work with other companies, and it just gives more opportunity to our criminal actors to attack. And it doesn't matter whether you are the company that had your email compromised, maybe it ends up being you're the one that loses the, 
excuse me, uh, the, the money and maybe not, but it, it just makes it easier for our, our criminals and harder for us as investigators and harder for us, of course, as, as, uh, or, or for all of you as private sector companies. I think it also shows the relatively, uh, I hope this doesn't come off the wrong way, but I think the, to me, the relatively impersonal nature of many transactions that occur at large scale transactions, because in many of the reports I read, it's, it's the same type of paradigm is we received a, an email from a vendor that we work with. They said they're changing banks or at the last minute, please don't send the money to point A, now send it to point B. And I think if there was more of a personal, of an expectation of a personal interaction when there's a change, that in and of itself, that change, that change in banking information would be the light bulb that goes off that encourages people to pick up the phone. But it happens so often, it lets me know that maybe that's just a common, more of a common business practice that I, uh, than I anticipated. And so it gives rise to the question, what are some of the things that we can do? And, and I know that you're gonna bring this up later, but what are the, some of the things that we could do to counter some of this? Um, some of these issues and that's a tricky one because when you have so many transactions you can't have every single transaction be a personal phone call there's just too many so anyway i think it it, it brings up that topic for me when i when i see this slide no I, I love that perspective sort of the the impersonal nature of of email conversations i think that definitely is something that plays into the favor of a lot of these cyber criminals especially the ones that are really good at social engineering attacks because they understand how to take advantage of conversations, regardless of whether they're impersonal in things like, like business transactions or things that may be very personal. When you get to things like romance scams, they know how to manipulate emotions through digital media in ways that other cyber criminals can't. Um, so I love that perspective. I think that's dead on, absolutely. You know, one of the other things when it comes to, B to BEC that the FBI and law enforcement in general has become very good at and has become much more aggressive on is recovering the lost assets of a lot of these BEC victims. So it's like the recovery asset team that was created a few years ago, um, you know, is, has done a great job at when those, when those attacks are, are, um, uh, are notified in a timely manner. Um, the, the success rate of actually getting those funds back has actually been very high. Um, you know, as you can see here, this is from the latest, the latest report that almost 75% of all of the funds when the, an attack is, uh, is reported to IC3 can be recovered by law enforcement, which is a fantastic statistic. Um, you know, Pete, I'll, 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 I'll ask you this question. You know, when we look at the recovery asset team, you know, what is their role and how do they recover losses when why are they so sort of integral in sort of, you know, uh, in getting a lot of these lost funds back? Sure. Um, and you're right. Uh, the recovery asset team, also known as RAT, um, is probably about three plus years old now. So it's a subgroup within IC3, which kind of works as like a, um, a direct liaison between victims, the financial institutions and obviously our FBI field offices. The, their main goal is to assist in reducing those losses that result from BEC and, and other similar related scams. So how do you activate, you know, RAT resources? Well, it's fairly simple. Um, obviously, we want you to, you know, make your complaint with IC3 as quickly as possible once you realize that there's been an incident. Um, secondarily, you should contact the originating a bank that's involved in the fraud so that th they can be um, put on notice as well. Similarly, that will help you with any kind of hold harmless letter or letter of indemnity that could be requ required. And then um, the, the RAT individuals will monitor the incident trends um, via IC3's website. And then you know, lastly, for a, a victim that's experiencing this is to you know, never make payment changes without obviously verifying an intended recipient. But the, the, the key to the um, recovery asset team's success is really um, uh, kind of un underlined by their relationships that they actually have with um, many banks. So over the, the many different reports that they get for BEC complaints and BEC losses, um, the recovery asset team reaches out to the financial institutions to be that conduit because they have received that report 
from a reporting party. And then by putting the banks on notice, um, you, can, you can usually kind of position our, um, you know, ourselves to, to at least get an idea of when there are monies that are still there. If monies are pending to be wired out, they can be held. And then you or a victim could work through their bank to make sure that, that whatever funds are still remaining in the account um, are, aren't sent and then that, that, that uh, transaction can be canceled. Um, but it's a it's a n newer team that was started within IC3, and they've really come up with a lot of various uh, you know successes. They also um, deal on a smaller scale with um, FinCEN, that uh, which is under the U.S. Treasury, that has a similar um, efforts that are, are conducted internationally. Um, that's not necessarily IC3 directing those kind of transactions, but again, similar idea that these individuals that report the losses, that information can then be communicated to the banks quickly to hopefully um, stop, you know, either in full or at least some of those funds so that it's going to minimize the loss um, to that reporting. Yeah, totally. I mean, again, I think the recovery asset team, the the job that they've done in recent years, you know, as BEC has become such a massive, impactful threat uh, is, is really understated, I think. I think one of the biggest things to drive home about that team is that in order for them to be able to do their job and have success, they need to know about the attacks, right? So, and so we can see that while they have a seventy-five percent success rate, that only in, in that's only for about four hundred, five hundred million dollars worth of actual losses. You still got two billion dollars worth of loss that the recovery asset team didn't even have a chance to recover because it didn't get to uh, didn't get to them. And I think the more that they're able to get involved in that process. I think the more money a lot of these victims will be able to uh, will be able to get back. And so with that, you know, want to uh, want to pivot on to the next. Can I throw something out there real quick? Absolutely. I'm so Please sorry. Do. I'm so sorry to interrupt yeah. you. I, I just wanted to, to touch on what you just brought up because I think it's super important. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that I think there's a, a gap in BC medications. And while there are many different options out there, um, you brought up that there were 2.4 billion in losses but the rat team was only able to attack about 400 million. And of that 400 million, they recovered about 75%. Bunch of different numbers. But what that tells me is the rat team can only activate when they know about the loss or the fraudulent transaction relatively early, relatively early, um, or, or relatively soon after the transaction, right? Um, and so what that tells me is the gap is that there is not a sufficient method for most companies to verify that funds got where they were supposed to go after the transaction occurred. And I recognize that, are we going to be able to verify each and every transaction very, very quickly? No, there's probably a ton, but an idea would be, let's say for transactions over a certain threshold for larger transactions, uh, having some post transaction verification method would likely catch some percentage of fraudulent transactions, which would enable people to report to the RAT team and, and then allow the RAT team to get, you know, potentially 75% of those funds back. So that's something that I thought was was particularly important when looking at those numbers. Yeah, absolutely. I to, to, totally agree with you there. And, you know, so, so when we think about, you know, for those who are, you know, who are watching this, and we think about you, know, you think about sort of how phishing has actually impacted your your organization compared to the year before. You know what have, what have you seen? Have, have you seen an increase in phishing attacks, especially successful phishing attacks, um, uh, last year compared to twenty twenty one? Are you seeing it go down? Are you seeing it go up? Um, you know, obviously, I think that from our vantage point, there's been an interesting. Uh, move, you know, especially we talked about this earlier, you know, to more people going to remote work. Um, but what have you seen? You know, I'll give you, I'll give uh, folks just a few more seconds to to answer this poll question. Interested to see how how it how it turns out. And you know, as we talk about phishing, you know, one of the really interesting statistics from uh, from last year's report is the just the overwhelming number of phishing attacks that. Uh, are reported to IC3 on on a on an, an annual basis, and you know what we see last year it was over 323 thousand phishing attacks that were that were reported to IC3. If you look back a little bit further, I think that jump from 20, 2019 to 2020, a lot of that has to do do with COVID coming into our lives 
and the remote work and enterprise focused applications becoming the primary target for phishing attacks. But what's also really interesting is actually the amount of loss that's attributed to phishing attacks is relatively low. We're talking about only $44 million of direct loss that can be attributed to, uh, to just generic phishing attacks. And you know, overall, the overall uh, amount that's being lost to generic phishing attacks goes down. And while some of that probably has to do with the ability to measure um, financial impact for these attacks is relatively, uh, is, is hard to do. Um, it sort of shows you that there are a lot of them out there, but the overall financial impact is relatively low, at least for what the, the organizations feeling those impacts actually see. Uh, Scott, why do you think that there are you know, so many attacks, but only $44 million worth of, of losses that we saw last year? I think when we're looking at a report like this, the report doesn't it can't necessarily illuminate the idea that many of those phishing attacks were lashed together with other complementary attacks. So it's phishing leading into BEC, phishing leading into ransomware, you know, phishing leading into cryptocurrency theft, right? And so maybe that I think those losses are typically then attributed to some other more recognizable cybercrime, and that's why I think those numbers are low specifically associated with phishing. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's you know, one of the difficult parts of any cybercrime activity is the fact that, you know, they don't, they don't happen or occur in a silo, right? So there's a lot of tangential activity that's happening, you know, especially even, even when you look at the actors themselves that are responsible for things like BEC, you know, based on the research that we've done, a lot of the actors that are behind BEC attacks are the same ones that are behind romance scams, are the same ones that are behind um, rental fraud scams. And, you know, they're all in this sort of this ecosystem of social engineering or cybercrime activity. And it's very difficult to differentiate between the two. Uh, Pete, what about you? Like, what do you think from a general phishing perspective? You know, why do you think that number has gone up and sort of the overall loss amounts have sort of stagnated a little bit? Uh, similar to what Scott said, as far as kind of the the reasoning why, um, because it's it's probably if you get fished and then you have some kind of loss associated directly with that phishing attempt or successful phishing action, and then you report that to IC3, I mean, I guess good on you for realizing that at that point, but I think it's usually gonna be that first step, which and then leads into what, what kind of what I call, you know, tr more traditional you know, cyber crime that can be reported and recognized as Scott said. The other thing is though, as far as the number of attacks, I mean, the, your your investment uh, into the game as far as a bad guy is, is pretty low. So it doesn't take much to, um, you know, kind of attempt these these kind of things. And usually when you're doing, um, if you're doing kind of large scale phishing attempts as a bad guy, then you're probably got a lot of, you know, spray and pray where you're, you're putting putting those fishes out there, you know, to a wide audience. So, you know, you, you can buy email, email lists fairly easily and fairly inexpensively. So I think it's just a very low bar for entry for um, that, you know, kind of your your online criminal. Um, obviously, I think the individuals that you had mentioned, Crane, that um, the same kind of groups that are doing the rental fraud, BEC, COVID scam, you know, the hurricane, you know, fraud scams, those are the same people and those are gonna be your more kind of persistent, you know, threat actors, if you will. But I think with this kind of reporting that we're seeing, you know, one, one speculation on my part would be, I think it's just, it's fairly, inexpensive to kind of get into the game to maybe make a couple bucks off of a kind of a low, the low hanging fruit um, with the phishing attempts. Yeah, so I, I agree. And I think what, what it also shows is kind of that, you know, while people think of cyber attacks as these overly technically sophisticated things, at the end of the day, we're just seeing more and more of these less technically sophisticated social engineering attacks or basic phishing attacks that are continuing to have success, even though they aren't necessarily technical in nature, and they don't require that much technical expertise in order to pull off. I, th I think you're absolutely right there. You know, one of the other things that sort of stuck out in last year's report is, you know, the massive increase in investment fraud attacks that were reported to IC3. You know, we saw, you know, if you look, track this back, 2020, that was about $336 million it blew up to almost a billion and a half dollars last year 
with an average cost of attack of over seventy thousand dollars obviously the amount of losses went up by more than four times um from what you guys have seen what has really driven this sort of massive increase in investment fraud attacks now that it's it's right it's sort of even though it isn't the level of bec it is now second in line it surpassed romance scams as the second uh as the second highest uh uh type of attack that caused as much much um, much financial loss. What have you guys seen as far as what's causing that increase? Um, Scott, I'll start with you. Sure. I think when I'm looking at this, this slide and it says investment fraud, that's such a broad term. And I think really what's driving this is uh, a rapid adoption of cryptocurrency related investments. And we've seen certainly even just in the last year, multiple large scale, you know, very public uh, large scale, whether it's an investment fraud in a particular technology that then ends up, you know, resulting in hundreds of millions of dollars in loss or more of a, a cyber crime specific attack against a technology resulting in loss. But I think it is adoption of cryptocurrency technologies in a very short period of time. And anytime you have rapid um, rapid development of any technology, there's going to be people that look to find holes in it early on and take take advantage of it. Now, yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's really interesting, I think, when you talk about the cryptocurrency and sort of the evolution of cryptocurrency and how ingrained it's been in a number, uh, in, 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 a, in, a pop, in a percentage of, uh, of the folks out there and sort of how it's become this big target of, of cybercrime attacks. Uh, Pete, what about you? Any anything to add from the investment fraud side of the house? I mean, the only thing I, I would probably add to this is if, is if you look at the um, back to the slide with the um, you know, kind of the numbers. I mean, you have twenty thousand, almost twenty one thousand different um, number of attacks, and then the average cost per attack, right, seventy one thousand dollars per attack, and with that increase. I mean, so I think what you also have is you probably have more individuals. You know, kind of alluding to what. What Scott was talking about, more people kind of getting into this, you know, kind of using virtual currency and cryptocurrencies. But additionally, I think people are, you know, and I, I don't know if it's, you know, this is Pete Traven's opinion, but could it be potentially pandemic related? If we're all going to be home more and we follow the GameStop meme stock situation and we're going to make it rich quick and have our Wolf of Wall Street moment, well, more of us are probably going to be susceptible to potential, you know, kind of scams i mean you know my dad always told me that you know the stock market's uh, you know kind of like gambling right so and that's there's some truth to that but if you now you take it a step further and you have the meme stock craze virtual currencies um, different unsupported virtual currencies um, you know that can go up and down with you know just by one influencer putting something on twitter i, mean, I think that's what you're probably getting captured in investment fraud numbers but again also like scott said it could mean a lot of different things. It could be some traditional, you know, stock manipulation, stock fraud, those kind of things. But I think um, that, I mean, 333% increase, I mean, that's that's pretty significant. So it'll, I'd, I'd be curious to see what that number looks like, you know, in from the 2022 report. Maybe it goes down, um, but I, I don't know. Um, and the, the fact that it actually surpassed romance fraud was also a little surprising when I saw the report, too. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, and the sort of the last topic, you know, that I would sort of, you know, that you know, sort of the last sort of crime type I think that we want to talk about here is ransomware, right? It's sort of the big one that a lot of folks have been talking about over the past year when we've seen, uh, when we've seen some of the big impactful attacks that have been reported in the media, whether it's Colonial Pipeline or JBS, these attacks that have really been more visible because they've impacted supply chains and critical infrastructure and things like that. And yet, what I think was really interesting in the most recent report is with all of the attention that ransomware has gotten over the past year, um, it didn't see it, you know, I was very surprised to see it only increase by almost two times uh, from 2020 to 2021. You know, if you had asked me to make a prediction of what that was going to look like, I would have said that ransomware would have probably been around the $100 million in law in direct loss, um, just because that's what it sort of felt right based on all of the attention and all of the, the increase in overall volume we've seen. Um, but that's not really what we saw. And so, you know, when we look at 
the total number of, ta of attacks, it's, it's definitely up. The average cost per attack is just over $13,000. And so what, you know, you know, that's sort of what we've, what we've seen. And I guess, you know, before we get on to the question, you know, how has ransomware for those, you know, on the webinar, who, how has ransomware impacted your organization uh, in the past year compared to 2020? Did you see an increase of those attacks, um, a decrease? Hopefully none of them were actually successful. Um, or, you know, is it something that you don't really, that you only, that you don't really know about? So, uh, so what I'm going to, oh, sorry about that. We got some, all right. So, so you know, with that, uh, so ransomware gets a lot of the attention, right? So, you know, it's always this sort of back and forth between BTC and ransomware, which one uh, is causing the most impact. Um, but losses based on the IC3 report are relatively low comparatively. What what are y'all's opinions on this? Why is this happening, um, Scott? I, I'll start with you on this one. Thanks. I, if you want my opinion on it, I think. Well, first of all, note that in the report itself there is a, an asterisk, right? Um, and it's basically saying that this particular number, the forty nine million, is sort of. That's the number that we have. That's what gets reported by the victim when they report to IC3. But two things. One is, I think the overall number of reports went up, was it almost 1,000? Not percent, but it, last year was maybe 2,700 reports, and this year it's 3,700, somewhere around there. And so my argument is, I see a lot of these reports coming in. And when someone gets hit by ransomware and they're reporting it, the first thing, what gets reported is, our network has been encrypted, our data has been stolen, basically help, right? But the victim company will have very little understanding on the front end of what their initial loss is. They may not have received any ransom request at that point. And so oftentimes these reports come along with a zero loss number. But uh, why don't, can you skip to the next slide real quick? So let's look at, at some numbers. Now, these aren't coming out of the IC3 report. There are many different reports out there, so I'll caveat that. But these numbers really tend to be associated with larger company ransomware victims. And uh, just look at these for a second and think, you know, what could these numbers represent when we're talking about ransomware? Well, the number in the middle, the $1 million number, is sort of the average cost of paying the ransom, right? We're talking about paying to have your data decrypted, I'm sorry, paying for the decryptor, maybe paying uh, to not have your sensitive data leaked online. Um, and sometimes in the more recent situations, it would be maybe paying to not have your network DDoSed by the attackers, right? So we're talking about maybe an average of $1 million mark. And then the $2 million is the average cost for network remediation. Remember that if you get hit by ransomware, and even if you do choose to pay the ransom, which I get it, there are many companies that would choose to do that, for various reasons, you're in a very difficult predicament. Even if you choose to pay to get the decryptor, it's not like you're snapping your fingers and your network is fixed. I've talked to some companies that they said even three years after they paid to get the decryptor, they're still dealing with various different network issues that are on the back end of a, uh, a ransomware situation. Because remember, this is a massive breach to your entire network. So. Uh, you're talking about incident response, possibly replacing a wide range of different pieces of equipment. So we're looking at maybe a $2 million average cost. Um, and so if you were to even take a quarter of that, let's say of the 3,700 reports, and again, those are just the ones that got reported to IC3, not the ones that came direct to the FBI, um, or the ones that maybe didn't get reported at all. Even if we take maybe a quarter of that number, of the $3 million and multiply it by the 3,700 reports, you're still talking two and a half billion dollars. So I think that number is, the 49 million is misleading and that's why it has the asterisk there because it's so difficult to identify what the real damages are. The $35, the $35 I put on there is one calculation of the cost to the criminal for how much it costs to launch a phishing campaign per month, 35 bucks a month, compared to a potential you know, million dollar gain from, from the victim. And I like putting those numbers there to explain why the FBI is putting so much resource into trying to tackle this problem. So that's 
maybe the long-winded answer to your question. No, I think it's great. I think it's, it's, it's context is everything when it comes to measuring the overall impact of cybercrime, whether it's the fact that things just aren't being reported or that at the time things are reported, you don't really know what the overall impact is. And I think when it comes to the difference between direct impact and uh, indirect impact, I think when you get with things that are, you know, in the, the ransomware world, the indirect impact definitely sort of carries a little bit more weight, um, even though most enterprise focused uh, cyber attacks are going to have some sort of indirect act, uh, indirect impact as well. Even when you talk about things like uh, even things like BEC are going to have remediation costs and things like that. So there's some inter indirect impacts that are not calculated that are there as well. Um, Pete, what about you? Any uh, when it comes to to ransomware, sort of what what have you seen? What are your sort of opinions on you know what's being uh, calculated when we look at when we look at ransomware? You know, I think Scott kind of covered it, and that that asterisk kind of to, to to the actual reporting information is kind of key. Um, but the other thing is, you know, obviously you have the loss numbers that are experienced by BEC and romance fraud, which are have been fairly high over the last, you know, five, six, seven years. Um, but additionally, you know, if you look at who is being taught, you know, not to, I mean, you know, it's not necessarily maybe the, you know, it's, I think it's some honest truth. And if you look at who's being targeted with these ransomware attacks and, and then now they hit on the critical infrastructure sector of, you know, various industries, right? So, and then you have, as Scott had mentioned, you have a lot of resources that are going to respond to these incidents to um, try to identify these individuals you know, kind of, a, you know, and for you know, a lack of uh, a better term, you know, kind of a, a whole of government approach to these efforts. Um, because if you have pipelines and power grids and, you know, hospital systems kind of coming offline or, you know, kind of in, in, in impacting, you know, the citizenry, I think you have this elevated sense of, you know, purpose to try to, you know, address this issue. That doesn't mean that because you have, you know, what I'd say, um, not you know, critical in industry being targeted with BEC, but you still have a loss amount that's in, um, you know, kind of in comparison that it, it delineates it. But I think what what you see now, and because again, the ransomware is getting the headline; it's above the fold. I mean, if um, you know, if I if I lose five thousand dollars or maybe a million dollars because I, I wired something on a on a pretty well uh, crafted email to a, a vendor that I thought was an actual vendor, that's not gonna really, you know, kind of, you know, not sell papers. It's not gonna get get views. So if you look at how we approach these things, a lot of it, it it's driven by kind of what the actual attack is, who it's attacking, and the fact that, you know, it, that's why it's getting, I think, the attention it is. And you have the same kind of efforts, you know, kind of on a, on a, a smaller scale of everybody trying to address BEC and romance fraud, but I think what, what the problem is, because that is an, an, an ever-changing kind of target set that's always kind of getting hit with information, it makes it more of a, um, a challenge um, in, in looking at that. But yeah, the numbers do look a little out of, out of place, um, apples to apples in that report, but I think that, that caveat um, asterisk is probably key, the, the key part of the ransomware that's report, uh, attacks reported to IC3. Yeah, and then you know when we talk about sort of what the FBI can do specifically when it comes to uh, to, to, to ransomware, you know this is Scott. This is this is your slide. I'll let you explain what exactly this means. Um, but you know, what's your opinion when people ask you like what the FBI can do to prevent or respond to uh, to ransomware attacks? Sure, and, and I you know I put this particular picture up when talking about ransomware, because oftentimes, if you look at the, the general paradigm, company gets hit by ransomware, their hair's on fire, it's a massive incident, they've got no access to communications, they don't have no access to payroll, they can't pay, pay their employees, and they contact the FBI. And I think this picture is, unfortunately, many times the expectation of what they're going to get is, for anyone who's a Harry Potter fan out there, this is the Elder Wand, and it's the most powerful wand in the wizarding world, right? And this is the expectation. The FBI is going to show up and poof, we're going to decrypt your data. And in post-colonial pipeline now, some of the expectation is if you paid a ransom, we're going to be able to get it back. Um, and then third is we're going to be able to fix your network in some way. And unfortunately, in most situations, almost none of those things are true. We don't have a magic decryptor. 
for the vast majority of ransomware incidents. And if we did, of course, ransomware wouldn't be a thing, although also encryption wouldn't be a thing. And the reason why ransomware works is because encryption works, right? Also, being able to recover cryptocurrency is incredibly challenging. So it's not something that happens very often. In reality, uh, oh, also, we, we don't, we're not a network remediation company. We're not an incident response organization. So that's not something that we can really assist with. In reality, what we can do is we will be there to try and collect data from you that would be useful for investigation so that we can try and identify who's doing it and then find any anything that we can do to try and slow them down or put a stop to it, whether it's working with, if it's someone, you know, of course, in a, in a foreign country, working with our foreign law enforcement counterparts. Um, sometimes we'll be able to get some intelligence ahead of time and identify that perhaps your organization is going to be a target. And we would let you know ahead of time that, hey, it looks like IP address, whatever it is on your network seems to be, have uh, been targeted and, and give you the chance to hopefully get ahead of it. That's more the reality of what we can do is working with you ahead of time, developing a relationship with you ahead of time. And if unfortunately you are a victim of ransomware, it's going to be collecting evidence so that we can investigate and hopefully put a stop to some of the behavior. That's awesome. Yeah, I love, I love, I love this side of the visual sort of understanding sort of what the FBI can and can't do and should, really should and should not do. And so, you know, as we sort of wrap this up, you know, a couple final questions that, you know, one of the questions that I, I always get um, when I'm talking to different audiences is, you know, what what is law enforcement doing to to prevent or, uh, or, or st to prevent or stop or respond to, to cybercrime activity? And I think there have been some some really interesting articles recently about how the, the thought process and the strategy that you know, federal law enforcement has started to go under, um, you know, from y'all's perspective, how has law enforcement evolved their strategy to tackle cybercrime? Uh, Pete, I'll, I'll start with you. Sure, Crane. Um, you know, I think the, the biggest key is developing those international partnerships. So um, if you look historically, probably about four, almost five years ago now, um, the, the FBI specifically made a, a, a huge push through our legal attache office out in, um, in located in Nigeria to kind of work directly with the Nigerian partners, um, you know, specifically on these types of uh, individuals that were targeting, um, you know, individuals in the U.S. and, and elsewhere in the world. So um, by, by increasing that liaison and focusing with the, those partners to figure out what can we provide them based on IC3 reporting or other parts of our investigation that we can share with foreign law enforcement to allow them to become better stewards of you know, a crime problem that they are well aware of, right? Um, but like, just like all of this that we've been talking about, it's an economy of scale. So there's obviously gonna be more fraudsters that are doing this kind of activity. There's only so many law enforcement officers to investigate the activity. So what we worked on using some of the data from IC3 and from different case teams is put together, you know, good targeting packages that could be actioned by our foreign partners, not just in Nigeria. And that resulted in Operation Wire Wire and then Rewired in the following year, 2018. And then just last week, uh, we were able to successfully announce Operation Eagle Sweep, which is similarly taking these kind of referrals from, from IC3, from case teams in the field, and then having them ultimately actioned, you know, by, by U.S. federal law enforcement, but then by foreign law enforcement. You know, so the as a result of you know, Operation Eagle Sweep, 65 individuals, uh, 40, uh, 25 of them that were in uh, various countries overseas were arrested, as well as um, you know the remaining uh, individuals that were arrested domestically here in the U.S. Um, and that was an operation that started in September and c concluded in December of last year. So those are the kinds of things we can do, and the more we can do that, you know, FBI partnering with Secret Service, U.S. Postal, and all of the you know, entities that do investigate these things on the U.S. side, then we can try to make those impacts because we, we probably have the victims and some of the, you know, the bad guys are here in the States. But many times, as, as we've referenced numerous times during this, this talk, I mean, they're not going to, the bad guys are going to be elsewhere. So we have to try to work with those partners that can, that can take action and, you know, bring that impact to individuals that, that are in places where we think might be, you know, off limits. 
Yeah, great. Thanks, thanks, Pete. And so, you know, wrapping up on on Scott on your side. So, you know, how have you seen sort of the overall strategy to combat cybercrime evolve in recent years? I think, as we see, there's so much more crime, whether it's just because it's being reported or it's actually being um, propagated, which I think is probably the latter. We recognize also that as as amazing as the operation that Pete just described is, we can't. It's not possible. We're not going to be able to arrest everybody to put a stop to this. And so we're also shifting our focus on how do we take away some of the tools that the cyber criminals need in order to, to effectuate their crimes, right? And so one of them is you look at the RAT team. The RAT team is one of the most amazing ways I think that the FBI has come up with to combat BEC and other types of fraud, which is take away the money before it actually gets there, you know, or, or recover the money before it gets sent to the uh, the criminals. And then also looking at the various services that they use, one of the big ones is if you steal a bunch of money, you've got to do something with it. And typically that means you've got to launder it. And so you're talking about romance scams. You're talking about a wide range of other things. These are all romance scams. While they are awful and, and they really prey on some of the most vulnerable people in our population, they are a tool that criminals use to launder money. And so educating people as much as we can and if there are illegal services that are offering money laundering services, trying to, to eliminate those as well. So looking at the key services that our, our criminals are using is another tactic that we are going after. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, I think the sort of the, the overall strategy of not just arresting everyone, you know, the arrest everyone strategy only doesn't scale very well. So you got to figure out other ways to identify ways where you can insert yourselves into the overall, you know, attack chain and try to impact things a little bit more, more effectively. So, I mean, I've, I've loved the way, you know, sort of some of the more recent uh, insights that I've, I've seen from uh, some, 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 uh, some federal law enforcement folks that, you know, understanding how they sort of, how they think about combating cybercrime in different ways now. And I think, you know, I think it's definitely on the right, the right track. You know, I could, I could, we could have this conversation, quite frankly, for a couple of hours. Um, but I think we do need to wrap it up. And so, you know, when we talk about what people can do to protect themselves against BC attacks, ransomware attacks, other types of enterprise-focused um, attacks, obviously that's where abnormal comes into play. You know, one of the things that we offer that's out there is sort of a, a risk assessment to help organizations understand um, what, which of these attacks may have have gotten past their existing defenses and understand how they can supplement those with some of the things that that uh, that abnormal does. Um, and so if anyone's interested in sort of, you know, taking getting more information about that, please uh, feel free to uh, to go to this website here or we can, you know, can respond to this poll question. And if you want to if you want to sort of understand more about abnormal and what we do to protect our customers against BEC attacks, ransomware attacks and other types of cybercrime activity. Um, please feel free to uh, to answer this question. We'd be happy to to reach out to you. With but with that, Scott and Pete, I really appreciate you hopping on. Uh, you know this this call with us today. I think you know the insights that we can get from you know from the folks that are out there that see this on a day to day basis from a very different perspective that I think you know enterprise defenders see it um, is really invaluable. And I really appreciate y'all uh, taking the time out. To, to hop on this with me and um and with that i will i'll go ahead and pass it back over to tom thank you very much crane uh, a lot of questions came in uh so hopefully uh, we can get to a couple of them here before we close out we're over time but i kind of figured we would be no big deal um let's see here uh i'll throw this out to uh our friends in the fbi uh you guys feel free whoever wants to chime in on this one uh we don't hear much about them uh probably because they target individuals uh getting to the romance scams um why are they so successful and what is being done to stop them? We didn't really talk too much about that today, but I'm, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, Tom, I, I can uh, attempt to answer that. You know, why are they successful is because they're, they're preying on, you know, um, kind of, you know, human nature, right? Everybody wants to be included, be selected, be loved, all these different things. And these individuals know that. And then if you look potentially at the uh, kind of, the victimology of these individuals, uh, a lot of them tend to, unfortunately, tend to be elderly. So that kind of adds insult to injury to these types of, um, you know, these, these types of victims that, that get rolled into these these types of schemes and and lose their life savings. I mean, it's, it's very tragic when you 
you hear and, and see these situations. Again, as far as what are we, you know, uh, what are we doing to, you know, to to combat this? I mean, there are a lot of different efforts, you know, that are uh, focusing on um, elder fraud, right, and fraud against you know our, the elderly population because these are the individuals that make up you know a, a good number of these kind of complaints and these kind of losses. So um, there's a lot of different efforts uh, through public service announcements and things of that nature, trying to, again, you know, make the the public or potential you know victims. A uh, little more aware to be a little more suspect um, that, that these are the kind of things that are occurring. I mean, it's it, it's, it's a small piece, um, but I think what you you'll see is um, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of these individuals that are doing the BEC and romance are the same. So as we work on, as as Scott mentioned, you know the key services that are perpetrating these types of um, you know frauds or the, the money laundering networks. Hopefully, you're also going to impact these romance uh, fraudsters as well because they kind of pivot and go back and forth, or it might be might be broken up into teams. One group might focus on you know targeting construction industry and real estate. Uh, another ones are doing the the romance piece of it, and that could be a a group um, of criminal of organized criminals that are kind of doing this kind of at scale. Makes me think of like it's like salespeople almost. You know, it's like they've got their territories, they've got certain products they're selling, and that's that's what they're doing. I mean, it, it is truly a business um, that these Yeah, and doing. it's very, very much like that, Tom. And it's very, um, yeah, I mean, they, they kind of have, you know, there are organizations and then, you know, then you, they recruit mules um, and the mules that are recruited, you know, the work from home scams, they're usually transacting funds for all different kinds of frauds, not just BEC or romance. So we've even seen where they're, you know, transacting in, um, you know, ransomware payments kind of thing um, as well. So it's a, it really has been uh, commoditized to a, to this uh, the, you know that business environment for the fraudsters. It's just too bad all that intelligence couldn't have been used for I don't know, getting us to Mars or somewhere else. You know I don't know just something something useful. <laughs> so the greed factor. Uh, one more question here. Um, let's see here. Uh, we kind of touched on it, but with all the cybersecurity solutions that are available right. Um, it seems that losses should be going up, or excuse me, going down rather than going up. But it seems like that's kind of the reverse. Uh, any comments, just real briefly on that? I, I, I can take that. I mean, since I don't know, if Scott, or, Scott or P want to you know, touch on the cybersecurity solution side of the house. But I think part of this is sort of the understanding how cyber criminals have evolved their tactics because they you know, they learn about what's working and what's not working. And for really a decade or more, it was all about trying to get malicious payloads into, you know, into enterprises and exploit exploit enterprises technically. But now what they've realized is a lot of, you know, existing email defenses have gotten, gotten pretty good at stopping those attacks. And so they've adapted their tactics to do more less technically sophisticated, more pure social engineering attacks that are that get that bypass email defenses, traditional email defenses a little bit more, uh, a little bit more effectively. And so, as we've as because those become more eff effective at reaching employees, and what we you know what we were talking about earlier in this presentation about the amount of money that's lost in each one of these attacks, that sort of is a force multiplier and allows these cyber criminals to make more and more money over time. And as they've sort of realized and they learn from their past mistakes and learn from what works or learn from other, you know, other scammers about what works, you know, it's all about sort of adapting those tactics and using what works to make more and more money. Because at the end of the day, almost all cyber crime is financially motivated and they're going to do whatever allows them to make the most money possible with, quite frankly, with doing the least amount of work possible. And so that's in what they have found. They're sort of in this sweet spot of figuring out what works and what makes them a lot of money. Got it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I've got one last thing from each of uh, our, our guys today. Uh, some parting thoughts. Actually, I'm thinking uh, maybe some homework uh, would be appropriate here. Um, Scott, if you wouldn't kick us off, uh, give the audience some homework. What's something that they should probably start doing now if they haven't been doing it already? Well, I think this one's going to be easier said than done. But all of us went through 
COVID, spending a lot of time at home, and that's been brought up. And a lot of us uh, were talking about the amount of stress that came along with being at home and being around, whether you have kids or, or what have you. And a big thing that came out of that is the amount of stress that we all dealt with increased the amount of rushing that everybody was doing, I genuinely believe. And so my piece of homework for all of you is we're talking about stress, we're talking about mindfulness, and we're talking about slowing down. So I'll throw the term out there, maybe mindful clicking. When you're reading your email, actually read it and don't have your head somewhere else because as many things as you can do to strip out fraudulent emails, there are gonna be some that get through to you and hopefully you wanna be the person that recognizes something doesn't look right here and be able to make a conscious decision as opposed to just clicking and then having to deal with the repercussions on the back end. Good one. It reminds me of the old highway uh, patrol adage, speed kills. It does. And in this case, it can ruin your organization with a ransomware attack. So appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Peter, same. Give us some homework. Sure. Um, you know, I'm not that I'm a shill for IC3, but I would say, you know, IC3 is kind of the one tool that, you know, we have to get reporting from you all in the public, right? So, um, you know, as you guys might come across things, maybe hopefully where there, where there are no losses or things of that nature, you know, please put it to IC3. Um, we're only as good as the data, but the really the real reason that should be put into IC3 is because then it, it gives us that chance, you know, for potential recovery, to potentially, you know, limit that loss um, that goes out the door. But it really does help the FBI and another federal law enforcement kind of steer the resources and, and direction of things. Um, again, you know, I, I bring up that investment fraud kind of spike. I think that that's going to have many people kind of interested in looking at that and kind of diving into the, those reported incidents to see what, you know, where, where are our resources aligned? Um, you know, do, the, do we have to shift different resources that are working on other things? Or do, you know, do, are we adding more, more work to people that are already, already doing certain types of investigation? So I would say, you know, and again, as a, um, not speaking as a, um, you know, a, a company or an owner of a company or an individual in a company, I think probably the last thing most people want to do is, is call law enforcement or contact law enforcement. And um, you see some of that, obviously, with the ransomware reporting or underreporting. So I would just say, you know, um, when you can and when appropriate, it, I, we would appreciate that yet. Yeah, you're utilizing that that outlet. Um, it's not the magic wand, you know, kind of like like Scott said, but it's it's one way that we can we can have that initial communication of incidents that you all are experiencing or potentially seeing. Definitely agree. And, and, uh, and frankly, if you're reporting this stuff, you might be actually saving your neighbor or somebody else, you know, from a terrible situation. So it's just it's just helpful for everybody, honestly. So thank you, Peter. Appreciate that. Uh, Crane, over to you. Take us home. Yeah, I mean, I'll be real brief on this one. So I think, you know, some homework, if, if we're talking about homework, it's it's about all about understanding how you're defending against attacks and how you're responding to attacks. And, you know, from a homework perspective, I would say go, you know, within your organization, you know, take a look and think to yourself, am I able to defend against these more basic social engineering attacks? If not, figure out a way that you, that you can do it, because quite frankly, from a financial perspective, that's what's going to cause your most your most loss. And then there's the other side of it is, you know, if something does happen, if you are if your organization does become the uh, the the victim of a BEC attack or a ransomware attack, the time to understand what to do is not when it happens. It's 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 way 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 before that. So put a plan in place right now to if my organization becomes the victim of one of these attacks, what do I do? How do I report things to IC3? How do I get in touch with the recovery asset team? To try to get my money back from a, from a BEC attack, and you know what do I do if my if my organization's network gets gets uh, in, encrypted? Um, so make sure you have that plan in place well in advance of any potential incident actually happening. Appreciate it, thank you, sir. I would uh, the only homework I would say is that if you really do want to get some connections, obviously you can reach out to the guys here, uh, but go to an InfraGuard meeting. Uh, they're all over the country. Uh, great organization to get affiliated with. They can help you with a lot of stuff. Uh, just super individuals that are happy to help you. They'll come in and help. Just You just got to ask. So that's what we have for today. Uh, let's, we're going to shift gears. I've got a, a bunch more uh, stuff coming up for webcasts. So we've got the devil in the details, why legacy breach and attack simulations fall short. That's coming up toward the end of the month. 
Uh, in May, we've got a couple coming up. How to shape security behavior and build sustainable habits, as well as injection vulnerability. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, developers and coding with that one. And then evolve from risk management to risk intelligence. So kind of a shift of uh, thought there and coming up in June. So uh, take a look in that resource tab, download the, uh, the report from the FBI, uh, register for some of these upcoming webcasts. Uh, and I want to say thank you again to all three of our gentlemen and the folks at Abnormal and the FBI for loaning us their uh, presenters. Uh, but thank you all for joining us today. This concludes today's remote session. We'll see you on future sessions.